expressed over and over again her con- Hey there, brother. Hello, hello. A little bit of my liberal propaganda bleeding over into the start of the call. <laughs> Is that a Rachel Maddow that I heard? I dared start my day without Rachel today, and I, I just I found myself trembling now by 6 p.m. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> it's a nighttime watch for us. On a yeah, you're watching her. You're watching her on time as it comes out. I end up catching her the next day, um, just with the way I've my schedule works. So. <laughs> Are you suitably outraged now? <laughs> I'm getting there. I'm getting. <laughs> I could not start my day with Rachel Maddow. That would be like, I wouldn't get any work done. <laughs> and yet you get to sleep somehow having watched it. That's okay. <laughs> well, I'm up working after that. So. Got you. Got you wind down time still. <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> So here we are again. Yay. Yay. So glad to be back and, and so sorry to have missed the last session. That's totally cool. Yeah. Do you know if, um, uh, what am I going to say? Um, I think, David, you should lead us today and get us started. Oh, my word. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. Wow. Lovely. Lovely, lovely. Dearly beloveds. (laughs) What was it? Was it a Clash song or Talking Heads? Someone also started. Prince. Oh, thank you. Yes, of course. Of course. My homeboy, we went to the same uh, elementary school, Lincoln in Minneapolis. Oh, serious. A couple cool. grades ahead. I, I missed it, but the vibe must have been there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, thank you, and, and great to be back. And um, When I reflect upon, you know, the, the great and sort of um, uncomplicated way we've evolved and experimented with different uh, meeting formats, um, if I just personally reflect, I, I loved it when we did just kind of quick, quick check-ins before we got into letting the book lead us just sort of by way of sort of, you know, embracing um, the consensus that we were willing to let this group, you know, be as deep as it, as it wants to be. And so it's been really rich that way. So if we could just go around and, and uh, whatever people feel like taking, you know, two, three, four, five, whatever, but just uh, like to know how everyone's doing and how another week of, of human incarnation (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> here at this late date in post-modernity or wherever we are. <laughs> Whoever feels moved, uh, just grab the mic. Well, I'll start, I guess. I'm, I'm in sort of overwhelm phase with work. Um, there's just like a bunch of projects happening at once and I'm got my hands in all of them and trying to help with all of them. I'm just like, ah, uh, but my right hand was on vacation for the last week. He's back. So I'm feeling like, all right, I can get a little more help now. <laughs> Good. And I'm, um, as this winds down, I'm about to start, uh, the finders course, which is this, uh, course Jeffrey Martin has put together. That's sort of a, a course on meditation training and slash uh, research project. And um, it goes for like four months and starts at an hour a day commitment up to three or four hours a day commitment I hear. Wow. So it's a huge endeavor, but I've, I felt pretty called to do it since I first heard about it. And finally. So it's just interesting to be, and, and what I like about, what I like about this and that is, I almost have to structure time for me. Otherwise, I'm kind of a workaholic, and I'll just work a whole time. This way, I'm structuring in um, non-work time, I guess, you know, time that can help me go more inward. Mm. So, um, yeah, and, and, and just, uh, um, just a last comment, just feeling a lot of gratefulness about reading the book and doing it with you all. Mm. It's definitely been uh, 
for joy and a pleasure and uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's all I got you. Don't hear you, Paul. Is that better? Yeah. Here we go. I can follow up with uh, what you ended with. I really enjoyed the um, attention that I've needed to give to um, the reading so that I can stay current. Um, and looking forward to our meetings, I notice I actually anticipate um, our get togethers pretty eagerly. And this is the first time I've done a book group, you know, uh, like this, certainly a fictional book group. Um, so this past period has been dominated by an out of town guest, a friend of mine from Colorado, who came and stayed for almost a week, and <clears throat> hadn't seen him for a few years. And I was able to watch his health get better and better every day. He had um, an eczema attack that was really mm. bad. <clears throat> and um, so uh, he got a little bit of treatment and I um, cooked a few things that weren't on his diet and he seemed to respond quite well <laughs> nice. and, and loved going out to uh, local restaurants here in uh, Lafayette, Walnut Creek, California, because there's nothing close by where he is for hundreds of miles out from a couple of cafes. Um, let's see. Um, and then kind of a phenomenon. I've noticed several uh, friends, I guess about four close friends and then a brother, all kind of having uh, pretty significant crises at the same time. So <clears throat> I've had the, um, I've been, had the, the, the crying shoulder syndrome um, and it's, been interesting just by virtue of the all at onceness of it. Um, <clears throat> so I haven't read the tea leaves or checked the constellations as to why that might be happening. Um, all of a sudden, uh, <clears throat> but coming back to the reading, um, I was aware in the midst of this particular section, um, Lynn's association with other men and feelings and connections and sort of the lot of his own inner exploration <clears throat> around that. And I could tell that in some way I was by virtue of the level of involvement with people that I care about, I actually realized I'd been in a hermit mode that I was much more engaged, much more uh, involved than this past time. Um, Let's see, what did I say? I've, I would guess it's been exercising my heart chakra. Maybe I would say that. And it's a, okay, that's my check-in. Beautiful. With your permission, I'll, uh, I'll uh, go last. We're at Fort Marco. How you been doing, buddy? All right. And I, I apologize, I'm making gestures over here. There's a mosquito flying around. <laughs> in the studio and it's been here all day i haven't been able to destroy it yet <laughs> but um, yeah so um i'm noticing that there's only a few pages left in the book mm. less than 100 this is this last uh section which we'll be reading or covering in the next week is is the end and so naturally, I'm wondering, how's this all going to work out? <laughs> now, where does this end? Uh, because it seems like, I hope at least, that we've, we've got to this moment of truth, the moment that the omega point that Lynn was uh, feeling imminent, was feeling kind of, you know, drawn toward or sucked toward. And it's, if I had to pinpoint it, it's that moment where they break through the, um, what they thought was the enemy breaking out of the cave or and we'll get to it, the discussion of that. Um, but I wonder if that's the, the, the point like beyond which we 
come back to some kind of like uh, resolution or some kind of ground. And now his return to Bombay is sort of like the last stage. I don't, I don't know what happens. And I guess uh, uh, it, it relates because I, I, like, like Paul, you expressed, I've felt a um, uh, appreciation for this time. And as far as how it works with my whole week and schedule, and like what you were talking about, Pam, the, the being burdened with work, technically this is sort of work for me, but at the same time, it's, uh, it's like the easiest work I have to do because, um, uh, well, I think because of the way that we've framed our conversations and the way that we've, I think, allowed ourselves to sort of relax into the text and to let our minds and our hearts mingle with the story, uh, is to me a relief to, to, um, operate or to, um, to spend time in that realm. So, uh, it lets me think about a lot of things or think about things in a way that's much more concrete. Like, even though it's a fictional story, because everything that's happening is so concrete, it's so much about the relationships between people, so much about the events that occur, the real lived life of people, not the sort of project you're trying to accomplish or, you know, the, like the, the ideal you might have. Uh, because it's such a human space, uh, I think it's, a relief from what can often feel like a sort of overwhelmingness, too muchness of everything else that, you know, we have to deal with in, um, you know, day-to-day life. Uh, so, and coming as well as it does toward the end of the week, uh, Thursday evening for all of us here in North America, sort of caps off the week as well. And, and I, I can kind of relax after this and take it easy to, you know, for the next few days, have more family time and so forth. So uh, I feel pretty good with the, the material. I feel like I, I read it. I reread, I reread sections of it. I took notes uh, and I was, uh, it, it, I, I, I found things like, even though I was sort of dis- disappointed in a certain way by how bleak it all is. Um, I found things to appreciate on this, on my sort of refresher and my, my review and so I hope, hope some of those will come out because, uh, you, always, you know, as with any form of art, any kind of deep literature, you always find something more when you go back to it and when you can live with it for a little while. So uh, mm. I hope that I've, I've like, re- I hope that I can remember some of those and that I've highlighted them and that they can come forth. Mm. Yes. I found it really interesting how how alive the story is for me um such that i can reflect on it as a measure or 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 turn to um lynn's journey <laughs> as a way to actually put my own real world journey in perspective and and i don't even think once that i'm referencing a fiction at all like to me it's that real as i mean it's it's that um true unto itself so it it lives as a as a certain kind of um um truth and i can sort of you know so i've had some some challenges you know in um i'm at a a critical point for example in in a business development project that's been a half year in coming and it's having all sort of the dramatic and and sort of uh, suspense those sort of mini arc undulations that a lot of uh, startup plots have of, about the time that you have to put out your hand for more capital other than your own. And um, so I just use that as reference that as an, as an example. And then I find myself then, you know, going through the reading and, and really like just now reflecting on it going, well, I'm so grateful to Lynn for, you know, the the rich story he's been sharing because it really puts all my worries in perspective, you know, I mean, there I could be, you know, in the mountains outside of Kabul, Kabul, but you know, here I am just in my privileged little boulder bubble, you know, worried about my startup. I mean, just, you know, having appropriate amount of, you know, humor about myself and, and, and the challenges of my, uh, my uh, my position. So anyway, there's kind of a combination um, check in and also touching on 
a, a check-in relative to the way the books uh, being on this journey with you guys and the way that the storyline of the book has been sort of um, inspiring me to um, hold a bigger frame of reference and imagine all the, the scale of stages upon which certain destinies can be played out. And uh, since I'm sort of at the edge of how much life can hand, hand me at this point, I'm sort of feeling like a wimp by comparison and, and also grateful at the same time. <laughs> anyway, that's my check-in. <laughs> um, you know, we, uh, um, please, yeah. I just, I just sort of wanted to piggyback on your comment about living your life, and yet Lynn's life is sort of a parallel, uh, 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 overlapping, uh, you know, something that you relate to in a way. And um, I noticed that with uh, series, TV series I get into, or books that have. I love fat books. You know, my favorite yeah. book, fat ones, where nice. you enter the story and you're 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 living it and. I find myself at times, just as I'm going through my regular life, almost confused. Which story am I in? There's a little mm -hmm. bit of overlapping that, because uh, uh, I tend to be a, an, an immersion kind of person. Mm -hmm. So I can't watch scary movies because I believe them when I'm watching it. It's just too much, you know. Mm -hmm. and, uh, <laughs> and I find that with, so I've noticed that somewhat with, with this as well. Mm -hmm. What world am I in again? You know, especially if you've been reading several chapters, you get up and you go do something. And anyway, yeah. so I, that's part of, uh, I like that. There's something about that. that mm. um, it, it almost is a little bit of an awakening moment too, you know, because mm. sort of you stick your head out of both worlds almost. Now, where am I? It reminds me of, uh, I used to do this practice where I was silent um, one day a week. And, um, and I loved it. But during the rest of the week, there would be moments when I'd be like, can I speak now? Mm. Oh, yeah. Okay, I can speak now. And cool. that would punctuate, you know, the rest of my week. And uh, that reminds mm. me of that a little bit. Anyway. That's beautiful. <laughs> we could just run on that for a while, right, Marco? I see both Marco and I like popcorn. Like, it's cool. <laughs> yeah, well, the question that I have about that is, why do certain stories come into your life when they do? And is there a rhyme or reason for that? Or, uh, is there a way that randomness or chance combines with destiny to, right. to give us the right, give us the, the mirrors that we need to right, see right. ourselves in some way? Yeah. And, like, and like, how do, like, yeah, how do, how do you like interpret those narratives? Like, and then how do you see the fictional aspects of your own self narrative? Because, we all have our stories about ourselves and who we are, what we're doing, what we're committed to our relationships, et cetera, et cetera. And like, even this right now, we're sort of, it's part of our story. Like we show it up here at a certain time that, that, you know, is part of a, now a, a sequence of events, a narrative of events of people coming, coming into the space, leaving the space, going off, doing our own thing, coming back again, talking about the book and sort of, a, it's had its own, flow to it and you know, its own ups and downs and its own sort of expansions and contractions. And like, if, you know, we were just so disposed, we could write the story of it. Like we could actually reflect back upon it in the way that Lynn has done, uh, or rather the author, Gregory David Roberts has done uh, with respect to his own life and essentially like fictionalize it. Um, and that's actually one of the things that started coming up for me in these chapters is how much of this is really true because <laughs> it's a novel mm -hmm. and at the same time the the real i guess the, the the understanding is or what the idea that i have is that it's a true story it's an autobiography for you know, and there may be some details that are different maybe names changed or something like that but that it's essentially true because it's so dramatic right and um, yeah, I, 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 want, I guess I wonder about that. I, I don't know. I don't know the answer. David, you may, being you know, more familiar with mm. the author and the story, you may have an idea about that. Mm. Um, but then, of course, you can ask around your own story how much of it is true. <laughs> how much it, are you just investing with <laughs> reality when, in fact, it's really just in your mind? And mm. it's just a story you're telling yourself. It's your own 
you know, novel. Yes, indeed. Um, I felt inspired just based on both of your juicy comments just now to, to, um, to mention, um, and I don't know, Marco and I um, have the, the good fortune of living within like, you know, sharing tea distance from one another. And so, well, I'd love to know you guys as, as friends that just hasn't been our history yet. And I, I welcome that level of contact between us if anyone feels inspired. But one thing that's true about me right now is that I'm a couple of years into a life sciences startup with um, one of two brothers who were very, um, uh, very deep mentors for me from a very young age, the McKenna brothers. So Terrence is a little bit more famous um, for being sort of a philosophical gadfly and kind of running the edges of mimetic uh, exploration or madness. And both of them are, you know, um, Dennis, the younger brother being a little bit more of the, the, the science, the hard, the hard credentialed scientist of the two, uh, a preeminent ethnobotanist, ethnopharmacologist. So Dennis and I are partnered now and three years into an adventure of, of uh, a per, a particular um, business model development, but I wanted to reference Terence, his brother, who who um, passed back in 2000. And Terence uh, loved uh, one particular jag you could never get him off if conversation gave him half an excuse. Was that whereas in the in the pantheon of formal sciences, um, physics has sort of become the preeminent litmus test for credulity you know it's sort of you know specific and measurable and yet reaches you know all the way down to the the, the top cork and it, it it makes pretense to know something about the big bang so deep time and cosmic space and all that kind of stuff but he said i truly you know as as a great fan of the reasonable you know therefore of science you know i have my inner experience has come to tell me that that if we were just pursuing um, the mystery of um, literature, like what is the physics of story and storytelling, we would penetrate into, into a domain of higher science, much more true to what's going on here. You know, he said, you know, reality, you know, his big thing was, you know, reality it is made of language more than it's made of quarks and atoms. So I'm just sort of, t- I felt touched to mention as we sort of play with it, you know, kind of the conceptual tease of, yeah, but I mean, what is, you know, what is the difference between what's really happening in the story we tell ourselves and therefore, you know, don't all stories gain this sort of meta credibility, but even beyond that, I mean, Terrence would, would run at this one with, you know, and he could go on an hour long tear building a, a rational case for why this is so that if you look, if you map as he had uh, out the entire um, arc of human civilization as key milestone events along sort of a, if you could, you know, sort of a, a, um, a scatter map of novelty, like what were the big moments when grand changes were happening, you know, the, 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 the mark of authorship, you know, the, the fact that this plot seems incredibly well, well crafted to, uh, to goad and bring cosmic humor and irony and, and synchronicities and deja vus and things like that. And so anyway, I just, I thought I'd riff on that for a second because I, I love that you both touched that. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> yeah, I I, I, I I would love to riff back, but I, I yes, the higher want, road. I want to see what, what wants, thank you, what wants thank to you. Rise. So then I'll playfully lean in in this wonderful <laughs> role you all grant me. We'll see how I do. Then the next piece of how we've done this beautifully in in my experience is we've been able to each kind of do another round robin on um on on chapters. Um, and so there's, there's four of us and isn't it, um, isn't it, it's, it's, um, the, the 35 through 39. Five so chapters. Yeah. five. Okay. Right, 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 right. So I could take the, we could take, I could take the first one and I could take the last one and we could just go around the circle unless anyone is feeling really, this is the only other thing I want to check in OCD and on process. Does anyone have us is super passionate about one chapter or another and like to, Make sure that that because um, I'd love to grant that wherever your your juice goes and whichever was really most meaningful, you might just champion setting that conversation in motion for us. Um, getting Paul's neutral and open. 
Uh, Marco, any you want to grab one before we just do the round robin thing? Um, I don't know. Because we'll all sound off, I think, obviously. I think 37 and 38 might be combinable. Nice. Um, just looking at my notes, I have yeah. kind of like less notes on each of those two, and I think kind of there was less novelty in those particular <laughs> uh, you know, nice. slices of the time wave. Um, but Okay, so, uh, uh, so if everyone's okay, I'll take third. Oh, sorry, I cut you off, Mark. Oh, no, that's it. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Uh, yeah, go nice. I just want to so, see what happens. I'm, well, so, before you go ahead, Mel, i got to say, I don't remember which chapter, what go, I, I'm up to date, but yeah, actually, no problem. like a week ago. So I'm so, a fuzzy about some of this. Let, let's do this. I'll do 35 just to set it in motion, and then we'll discuss until we feel like we've honored that one. I'll just do the bullets of what happened in 36, just the three or four highlights, and then hand it to you to say, you know, get us going on what that touched for you and what was interesting. And then we'll rotate around uh, to the other guys. Is that cool? Okay. Were you, were, nice. Okay. Were you, when, so, when you said you, who you were, who were you saying you to? Oh, I, I, I'm sorry. I thought that I would save you, Marco, and you, and you, Paul, to the last couple uh, chapters. You had mentioned a couple that you were interested. So I want to make sure that you get like 37, 38. Maybe Paul will do 39. Okay. Is that cool? Okay. Go for it. Love that. Okay. Yeah, we're teaming so, up on 36. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. So I'll start us out on 35. You'll be 36 and the boys can uh, bring it all home. Um, yeah. So, I mean, you know, this ordeal of being at war with the, <laughs> with Lynn has, um, uh, has just been, um, you know, I, I share Marco's original comment in the beginning. I, I remember the first read through, obviously I'm on my, or I mentioned I'm on my second, but the first read through is like, oh my God, this book is getting thin and we're, I don't see any resolution <laughs> in sight, you know, <laughs> you know, I, I, I've been convinced of this war as a chance to, to see whether or not Cutter's theory about like, you know, transcendental good, you know, uh, actually being sort of lived out. Now I'll be the judge of that, but I mean, am I not going to get any resolution or is this going to be just a sales pitch then for, for what he must've been planning it at this point, you know, yeah. right. So, uh, which I understand, you know, is just, again, a bunch of sort of, you know, notes, et cetera, et cetera. But in any case, so, so, uh, starting off just kind of hewing to the, to the, the, the highlights of, of what happens, um, you know, there, there. This is the moment when you know there's that whole culmination of you know the dramatic departure at you know Lynn's discovery of of um, of of the the great betrayal you know of 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 Cutter Khan's betrayal, and and so um, then they then he he rides off, and all of a sudden here we go, thirty five. Now you know uh, we've got Nazir, you know, dragging bodies back into camp, being nearly dead himself, and then this sort of shock, like what would this, what is this story going to become without Qatar Khan? And so, um, um, so this happens. Um, uh, you know, they go through this cycle of recovering from exhaustion, right, and. Um, uh, the um was it was it it was Suleiman wasn't it that 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 well in that, any case yep, yep. Mm -hmm. right 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 involved. exactly so you know so Suleiman calls a meeting and tells of the whole encounter we get the story and we still have Habib you know rising in and out of the plot with his with his madness of torturing and killing and all that um you know um so, uh, you know, as we get the end of sort of that, that, that story, the recounting of, of what happens, we get, you know, the madman himself reappearing, you know, and that unbeknownst to everyone, you know, these guys are literally, you know, sitting, they're, they're, they're hunkered down, barely surviving. And he's been with his amazing, sly, mad sort of skillful risk taking, he's been able to map out the fact that these guys are imminently in a kill zone and there's you know troops all kind of lining up and getting strategized to just come in and finish these guys off and they've zeroed in on where they are so now the the whole dilemma of whether to trust habib you know um etc et so so we have this this big dramatic culmination right with the the Russian helicopter, you know, and who survives that and what does it take out in terms of their, you know, their survival abilities, you know, um, 
but it turns out we learned that like Habib himself is the major focus for the Russians like laying in so heavy because he's just been, you know, uh, almost like beyond uh, any single man's ability to be such a, you know, a destructive warrior, but he's psychologically even more destructive. Like his story is preceding him about his madness, et cetera. You know, so, um, and that's, that's my notes on 35 and there, I think, you know, I think we're, we're, I think the transition into 36, if I can hand this over is, is, um, uh, according to some of my notes here, they are, um, I mean, they're running out of food, obviously, right. Um, Pakistani border, um, some talking about some of the younger fighters, right, um, disappear. They decide to head out to see whether there's a pathway of escape. Um, you know, they were supposed to go out, scout positions, and come back. So the, the camp is actually getting really close to starving. Um, and, and Habib again pops up and says, no, you know, I've been, I've been like here all along watching you guys, watching them. And then he's got the go-to on how these guys can possibly uh, break out. Um, so they, um, they, you know, they seems like the way I read it is they kind of felt like they had no choice. I mean, he's nuts, but clearly he's the only one with the mobility to have credible intel on, on, on what's going on. So they debated a bit. Right. But I think S- Suleiman is the one who suggests, I think they get into like the last meal of like rotten goat. I mean, you just don't think this thing can get any worse. And then you've got to go with them into the insults of the, the temperature and the last food and the hunger and trusting a madman and imminent, you know, attack, etc. cetera. Um, you know, um, Ed, there's a, a unique piece that we can talk about a little bit more, right? We, I think Lynn, Lynn learns that Khaled had been uh, one of Carla's lovers, right? Um, so, um, so there's some talk there about the history of Abdullah and Kader and that, uh, you know, Khaled didn't, didn't really like, um, or didn't believe anything was my note assures Lynn that Kader loved him despite his machination. So something kind of coming around to back to Lynn to be, that tempts the possibility of melting his heart in relationship to Kader Khan. But in any case, um, we've got, uh, you know, Habib, um, how was that? Um, there was a, there was this, I just wrote the quote, but I'm trying to remember the context. Do you remember um, strong men make their own luck, right? Mm-hmm. So that was, was it, that was, that was Habib, right? That, yeah, that's what he yeah. said. To, yep. to Lynn. Exactly. To each, to, each man, to each man individually. That's right. So, um, you know, and then there's, there's, you know, now he said different things to different people. Right, right, right. That's it. That's it. I knew I, I, I hadn't taken enough that was, notes. Oh, I got it. And, yep. and the last person he speaks with is uh, Khaled. Right. Who then, who then kill, kills him with a knife, right? We hear this right. scream. Exactly. Right. Yep. Exactly. Well, and I think it's because I think he kills those two. Those young two scouts, scouts, right? Right. He kills the two scouts. Juma and, um, Hanif. Hanif. Oh, great. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Um, so then, then of course, you know, revenge is, is levied and we've got the madman gone, right? Um, we got Khaled wandering off in the wilderness, you know, no one can stop him. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the, was it the next day or soon thereafter they've got, they, you know, the five men kind of, you know, do their rush through the, you know, they're pushed through the Russian positions Right. And there the mortar attack happens. Right. Um, uh, there was some kind of almost glorification for Lynn about the, you know, the moment of battle and the purity, right. purity of singular motivation, etc. But those are my notes on these two chapters. Mm-hmm. And I'd like to open it up to anyone sounding off on any of that. Thanks, Dave. I think. The thing that stood out to me the most was Lynn wrestling with his love for Kaderbai and the betrayal. Mm. And even though he felt incredibly betrayed, you know, he, he still loved him. And mm. the betrayal didn't kill the love. Um, and just his sort of wrestling with that. For some reason, that really touched me. I think that that's just such a human thing, right? Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, for me, we, that was one of the most poignant parts. Go ahead, Marco. Well, we we learned something else too about 
Kaderbai's relationship with Carla, which uh, Carla tells him, and it's just one line, really. They don't go into it that much, but uh, Kader had prostituted Carla to gain influence with a military uh, I, a general or something like that who was interested in her. And this, is, this comes out when Khaled is telling, is really confessing a few things to, to, um, to Lynn just before he, he kills Habib and, and goes off. Uh, so, uh, and I think that that may relate to the beginning of this chapter. I, I, I'm not 100% sure, but... Uh, I, I found the first paragraph, particularly of chapter thirty-five, when I went back and, and read it again, to be um, really quite powerful, and uh, and maybe worth reading actually too. Like maybe just bringing the text into it and sort of the evocation, mm-hmm. because it, it it really culminates perhaps in at the end of thirty-six and that that breakthrough, that moment of. Uh, um, breaking through the enemy line and the, the moment of glory. Uh, what, what, would it be okay for me to read it? I'd love that. So this is the beginning of chapter 35. And, um, you know, th- uh, I'm, I'm just going to read it without commentary uh, after we, we talk about it. Men wage wars for profit and principle, but they fight them for land and women. Sooner or later, the other causes and compelling reasons drown in blood and lose their meaning. Sooner or later, death and survival clog the senses. Sooner or later, surviving is the only logic, and dying is the only voice and vision. Then, when best friends die screaming and good men maddened with pain and fury lose their minds in the bloody pit, when all the fairness and justice and beauty in the world is blown away with arms and legs and heads of brothers and, sis- of brothers and sons and fathers, then what makes men fight on and die and keep on dying year after year is the will to protect the land and the women. And yeah, I, um, like what's, what is, like when I ask what is the glory, like what is it that impels them to, to go on? like in the face of overwhelming uh, near certainty of death, right? I mean, facing down Russian helicopters, like in the mountains of Afghanistan and starving. Like they're, they, 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 they go from 20, when, after Qatarbai's group leaves, there's 20 people left. They go from 20 to 11 to six. And then those six survive on the rotten, on the goat, on that one goat, for four weeks, and then when when all they have left is the um, the rotting like hooves, the, like the non say the, the, the uh, un, non permitted uh, meat. I forgot what's, it's not under the halal like laws. Um, what keeps you going? Like, you know, why when your f- fingers are freezing off when. Uh, you know, you're, you're, you're losing weight. It really seems hopeless. What keeps you going? And he talks about later how when, when these men are dying, they always think back to their villages, to their, their towns, to their wives, their mothers, their sisters. And I wonder if there's something still in Lynn that's thinking about Carla that, mm. uh, that, that, like, that some some residual hope you know and still there it shows up later in 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 the later chapters like his conversation with lisa when she asks do you still you know do you love her do you still love her i wonder if that's a a part of it Uh, he doesn't have land right he doesn't have his own land anymore but he has he has that love and um and at the same time it's survival it's just pure the pure lonely will to survive is, is how he puts it as well so Maybe it's not, it may not be just that romantic either. Uh, anyway, I mean, that's some just reflections on that. But um, mm. the other part about these pages that I think was really interesting is, is the way that Habib is transfigured into this nearly supernatural being. Like he, he, his, his effect is far greater than a mortal regular man. Like he he's regarded as some kind of a some kind of a ghost or some kind of a demon. Uh, a one man terrorist outfit. Yeah, uh, and 
fire <laughs> terror everywhere. Yeah, yeah that, and and he 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 is like the definition of terrorism because it, it inspires irrational, like the whole, you know, all these uh, these men, Russian units, Afghani units, like they're looking for him for this one man, and. In some ways, like the almost the extreme, extreme version of like what uh, Khaled uh, had become, as far as feel, totally filled with hate, just like running on hate, and what Lynn perhaps feels as one of the potentials within him, and one of the things that is driving him. But, um, but it's but at one point, like because Habib wants what he wants from them, from these guys. He wants them to give them the survivor, give him the survivors. So whoever they kill or, or whoever they don't kill in their counterattacks and their operations, he, he gets them that, that they're his bounty because he, it's like he feeds, like he feeds on the torture and the death that he inflicts. Uh, and it's like something else is really feeding there. That, that's no human, normal human hunger. You know, that, that's a supernaturally like evil hunger that is like manifesting through him. And, um, and I, thought, I found it very interesting that Khaled is the one who, who kills him because Khaled is the, the other one who's really like running on, on hate and who shares like the same life story as, as Habib in, in, in so far as losing their families. Um, so, yeah, I mean, th- those are some, some reflections on, on the chapters here. You know, Khalid, Khalid sort of took responsibility for him. So in a in a way, to me, it was quite appropriate that he's the one that takes his life too. I mean, mm-hmm. it's as if I mean I don't know, but it's as if he finally realized there was no redemption or going back for Habib. Habib, and he just that's how he had to handle it. I don't know. That's what I made. Well, he would smile when he saw him. Remember, even Lynn even remarked that he was a bit jealous of that. Like he seemed happy to see him <laughs> and maybe because it represented some hope of salvation, but maybe because he recognized himself mm-hmm. in, in the madman. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, like, eventually Khal- Khaled commits suicide. I mean, I don't know, maybe he somehow reappears later, but right. I and mean, he, he divests himself of all of his possessions and anything that would protect him from the environment. And he walks out into the, into the you know, into the wild. One of the things that struck me about that scene where Khaled gets his vision, and it's Lynn who's desperate to keep him from walking out into the snow, into the white, and um, but it's Nazir and maybe Mahmoud. I don't remember who the other one was, but are prizing his hands. And allowing Khaled to go as if they have some sort of shared religious understanding or spiritual um, understanding about um, what Khaled's going through. They say, did you see his face? And then says, yes, he did. And there's something about, um, yeah. I don't know what we would call it, their, their understanding. Maybe it's their shared um, religious uh, backgrounds or whatever. But I definitely remember that part. He seems possessed. Like he, he's chanting uh, verses from the Quran. He doesn't really even register Lynn trying to stop him. He, he just kind of just keep just goes and go, goes completely into this other state, this other dimension. Like it's he's seeing something. Like he's he may not even really be aware of that that he's walking into his own death in, in the you know, in the mountain. The, in the forest or whatever it is there. Uh, I wonder, I mean, if there's some kind of way that he's, how would this work? But almost like taking the spirit of Habib with him or something, or, or sort of like taking it into the afterworld, if you will. I mean, is there some way that there's a, um, an, um, an exorcism or something like that, like between Khaled and Habib, where like, Khaled is like delivering his soul or something into like by virtue of killing him is has absorbed his soul and is is sort of releasing it into into the wild so, something some kind of I don't know what to call it exactly but transmutation or or, or the like um, 
could be going on there. I, I don't know. It's, it's, yeah, it's, mm-hmm. it's very interesting. <laughs> it's very interesting. Uh, Beautiful. Anything else for anyone on, on 35 and 36? Mark, do you want to take us into 37, 38? Sure. Well, uh, what happens is that where, where, we, where we're left off with in chapter 36, at the end of it, is that uh, Lynn and the other five you know, men are, have no choice but to try to make a, an escape. And, uh, and in the course of this, there's mortars uh, being fired, there's explosions, and Lynn gets hit with, with shrapnel. He goes down unconscious. And we learn, we, we pick up the story of part five uh, in Pakistan again. Uh, and Lynn is emerging from unconsciousness. Uh, and we, we learn the story. They look at a photograph of all the, the men before their mission. And we learned the ones who've survived are Nazir, Mahmoud, and a younger man named Allah Uddin, which is translated as Aladdin. Uh, we, meet, we learned that there was a military commander named Masood, the lion, who was fighting on the side of, against the Russian, uh, against the Russians, uh, and had been engaged in a fire fight with with them or had been, uh, they'd been, they'd laid siege to Kandahar for one thing. Uh, but then they were also engaging the Russians in this particular region. And in fact, the, f- the fire that hit Lynn, Nazir and, and the others uh, wasn't coming from the enemy. It was coming from their own friends. It was friendly fire. We, we, we learned that. A- and that sort of, Un- undermines that whole notion of a glorious breakthrough of a glorious like victory and escape yeah. against the enemy, uh, which he, he felt and he admit it's interesting because he admits that he felt that he admits that he, he like that you've seen it. You see, you see it in, in the, these old movies about the British empire and stuff like that, that sense that you do what's honorable you do, and, and, and you face death uh, honorably and nobly and in that moment that there's an ecstatic, it's in war and peace even. Uh, Tolstoy writes beautifully about this. And, but here, Lin can't believe in it. Like he, he realizes that he's had that experience. He's kind of fallen into that romantic ideal. And now he learns that, yeah, indeed it was, it was not what he thought it was. It wasn't all that glorious. Um, and, uh, we learn about his fingers. He, Nazir has saved his fingers. They were going to cut, cut them off because they, I guess, were gangrenous from the frostbite. Uh, Nazir threatened to shoot uh, the doctors who were going to cut off his, who were going to cut off his fingers. Uh, and, and now we're back in Bombay and uh, there's, Qatar is gone. And so there's the question of how the, how the mafia sort of world is going to reconstitute its, itself. Who's going to step into that leadership vacuum. And we can, we begin, um, well, not quite in 37, but I think, I, I think in the next chapter, we begin that we begin to learn about who those figures are. We also uh, meet Didier and again, uh, and, um, and Lynn, I think the important point, I guess, about this chapter is Lynn is, is gripped by a, a purpose. He has something he wants to accomplish now in Bombay. And that is, of course, that he wants to kill Madame Jo. Like Nazir. They both have a... Aha. Yeah. They both have a mission. Indeed. Do you, you want to uh, relay Nazir's mission? Because that's a whole other subplot that, I've, that I totally left out. Uh, sure. Well, well uh, Nazir knows... Who was the traitor? Who betrayed Cotterby? Um, oh, and Cotterby knows it too. And you find out later it's because of what happened in Pakistan that it was Ghani because Ghani was Pakistani. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, but Lynn does not know this during that period. Nazir just, you know, this is Nazir's focus when he gets back mm-hmm. to 
Hilgani. And, 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 you know, the way that he writes it, you know, you know, when Lynn's visiting Ghani, you know, Ghani is the traitor just because of a few things he says, like, Oh, it'll be Nazir, you know, those kinds of things. Um, but you don't, I hadn't yet put it together that he was Pakistani. I didn't, I wasn't following the threads well enough to sort of figure that part of it out. Mm. But. Yeah. So, so, um, Abdul Ghani is the traitor. He's got these connections in Pakistan. Uh, he was really, he was worried about Qadr Bai going overboard with this whole mission, spending way, spending too much money on it, too many resources, etc. I think he got afraid. Uh, and, and we learn as well that Abdul Ghani is the one who is be, behind the right. Sapna. Right, that whole thing. And that, Qatar by knew about it, but it was weird because he sort of seemed to sanction it, but at the same time, uh, it, they seemed to also have this rogue aspect to them. Uh, and Abdul Ghani's, you know, men were acting. Ultimately, they wanted to, to I think, take out Qatar by as well as they had with Majid. And um, so once that happens, they have to take them out, and that's. Was that's what Nazir's purpose in in life was? That's kind of that. That's there was a good line actually where he said it was his it was his purpose, not his meaning in life, uh, to to return to Bombay and to avenge uh, the the betrayal. Um, and then I guess the other thing that happens, uh, of course, is the battle with. Uh, not just Madame Jo, she's defeated. She, some ha- thing has happened. The crowd has turned against her. They've burned down her palace and she's living there as this sort of wreck of a, of a woman. Uh, when Lynn encounters her, he can see immediately that she's uh, really not, not a threat anymore. She's not, she's a shell of her former, of her former self, whatever that was. Uh, and th- that vengeful in- impulse dissolves. So he suddenly decides that he doesn't want to kill her. He feels mercy, uh, I think, for her. And then the same thing, he ends up feeling, and the same thing recapitulates with Rajan and the tw- twin uh, that we, had never, we didn't know about, the surprise twin, uh, where he has the opportunity to kill them, or Didier is, has the opportunity to kill them and offers Lynn the chance to get, you know, to, to help. And, uh, and he puts the gun down and decides to let them live. And he's the only one who hasn't killed them. He hasn't killed anybody. I was just going to say yeah. that. That was a key pe- moment when they said that. Yeah. That's how he was different from everybody else. Yeah, that's right. He hasn't killed anybody. So I, I don't know if that will change or not. We still have some pages left. Um, but, uh, but he doesn't go, he doesn't cross that line. And... Um, I guess the last thing we learned is that Carla has a boyfriend that's mentioned. We don't, we don't know anything ab- about him, uh, but he, she's back in town. And that may be setting up a later meeting. I don't know. Yep. Okay. What do you think, Paul? Did I, did I get everything? All the essential details? Yeah, I thought you did. It was great. Right. And I like the fact that you thought to combine the two because they flowed very well, kind of almost like, you know, one long motorcycle ride uh, of two chapters. So, beautiful. Paul, you want to take us into 39? So, um, in 39, it starts with... Um, Ghani getting his just desserts. Um, we find out actually what happened um, that while Lynn was in Madame Joe's um, palace doing what he was doing step by step simultaneously, Nazir was uh, and some others were taking care of business with Ghani, right? Completing that that purpose. You know, and, Paul, just to. It was sort of like he was laying out a screenwriting thing there, I thought, the way he had them happening parallel at the same time. That really felt like a script 
writing pieces. It's like the it's like the Godfather. It's a, it was like the end of the Godfather when when uh, they kind of clean house and they assassinate all the other family um, mob bosses. So I got that too because I totally got that that sense mm-hmm. of parallel events happening. Like you know, if, if you were watching a movie, you'd, you'd be cutting from one to the other. <laughs> totally. Sorry, go ahead, Paul. No, I like noticing that because I was also aware of how uh, Lynn had accidentally fallen into one of the secret passageways. So we get to go with him and kind of get a sense of Madame Joe's, you know, um, depravity, her um, uh, voyeurism and so forth as he's, you know, in one of those secret uh, passageways between the rooms and the metal grates and so forth. Um, I um, I was thinking uh, that, Marco, you've mentioned a few times the book has a certain cinematic quality, like thought for the for the screen, and um, I was noticing that too. Um, so uh, we get the whole uh, piece about Ghani and Cotter and how they were colluding around Sapna and that Sapna has gotten out of control or had gotten out of control. One line stood out for me when um, – <clears throat> Uh, there was a discussion about Majid, who was part of the council. And uh, because the police were on their tail, a particular inspector, um, that it was decided that if one of Cotter's council was eliminated, then it would throw the police off. And there was one little line that said, um, Cotter was cool with it. Yeah. yeah. And so we kind of get a sense of some of his own, you know, Godfather-like ruthlessness and um, willingness. Um, so Majid was had been sacrificed, um, and then we get into meeting the men of the new council. And there's a bit of uh, some mafia wars that go on as the um, uh, it comes out that Cotter's no longer there, and there's a struggle for the territory, and Cotter's men um, s- succeed. Um, there was a term also in the description um, about Ghani's disenchantment with Cotter. Um, the term hero curse showed up a couple of times, which I thought was interesting that Cotter had a hero curse on him. Um, and Lynn gets invited to join in the criminal cartel. Uh, he can be an observer on the council. Um, and uh, his specific task is to run the passport books. And then his musings about being relatively identified, but also disidentified with a family of criminals. And explorations of themes of honor, um, the, the operation being a Red Queen contest. I thought that was an interesting term and idea. Um, and uh, something I found particularly poignant for Lynn's state, I guess his interstate, was when he went to Johnny Cigar and somebody named Kishore or Kishori and was going to invite them to be part of his um, passbook um, activities. And they were disappointed and, and, you know, smiled but said no. And they were kind of maybe a bit offended. And so Lynn asked himself, um, was I so out of touch? Have I become so out of touch with the thoughts and feelings of decent men? Um, and then there's the big walk and talk with Salman, um, and this one three word phrase um, that occurs <clears throat> in a discussion about Cotter by he said we all did, and that triggered grief in Lynn. Finally, this deeply felt um, resisted longing and loss got triggered in his heart, um, and the term for that was assassin grief. Mm-hmm. And um, then there's this led to this meeting at the Shamiana restaurant. And he's, you know, again, <clears throat> explorations of sort of difference and similarities between himself and his fellow criminals and the family quality and purpose. And Lisa walks in. And uh, there's talk and there's uh, sex, apparently. And more of Carla's story gets elaborated through Lisa. And... Um, the, the feeling of love but not being in love, so some sort of differentiation there, changes that, that had gone on inside Lynn. And um, Lynn makes his way out, and there's 
I, Mukul, I'm not sure how you'd say that, but Mukul and Temptation. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Mukul is a, is a heroin dealer. Oh. And, right. and so we get inside uh, Lynn's, you know, yearning for that particular oblivion. And once again, he's saved by Abdullah. Yeah. And um, surprise, Abdullah's story comes out shortly thereafter that he wasn't, in fact, killed. Um, and then at the um, – before he can go back, um, even though Abdullah's saying, this is – I'm your surprise. This was a surprise for you and going back inside. Lynn needs a minute by himself outside. Um, I don't know. Maybe at the end of our time, we can just read – as like we've done before the last little two paragraphs of that i found it to be really powerful we see if we remember to get there but um that's what i took notes on it's a great uh, a great summary and there's a lot in there yeah. who's ever cooking with something go first why don't you read those two last pieces Me? Oh, cool. Sorry, can you find it? Sorry. Can you find that, David? I've. Um, well, I usually it, it's both are really fine. It's great to read. I did have the last couple uh, portions of thirty nine queued up for maybe closing our session that way because I've enjoyed that in the past. But I love also this tradition of reading pieces to each other so whether it's that or some of the other beautiful portions of the chapter i'm, I'm open marco you had an, a sense about what you'd enjoy um I, I guess i wanted to say a couple more things about the assassin grief yeah the, it, it, it's interesting how it strikes and how it sort of seizes him at a certain point and seems to come out of nowhere it seems to be triggered by the like the smallest phrase right the, that that and I don't know exactly how that phrase act worked to trigger that feeling because he, he alludes to it multiple times in the lead up to this point that he alludes to the fact that he can't grieve or that he hasn't grieved, that you know, he experienced the betrayal, that there's something that is unresolved, something that hasn't come out, something he hasn't really faced in himself. And so it's there. And, and the idea of the assassin grief is that it ambushes you when you don't expect it. So now he's there. There's some kind of surprise uh, that uh, uh, Suleiman or Salman, Salman, uh, who with Sanjay is the other, you know, sort of head honcho in this new council, uh, they have set up for him. The surprise is Abdullah, and he doesn't know that yet. He gets hit with this grief, and um, and it just like works on him, right? It just kind of works on him. It keeps on hitting him, even as he's with, I think Lisa. It's it's behind the scenes and um and yeah i mean we're gonna get to how that resolves itself but uh i um i guess that one is just that how that how that worked because i mean one thing with grief and with like intense emotions in general you can't manufacture them like they you may know that they're there. You may feel that something is going on, something is off, but it's sort of like almost volcanic, right? It builds up. And then until there's some break or some kind of precipitating event, it doesn't hit you. And maybe the softening around uh, the, the, the occasion, maybe the presence of Lisa in this sort of like field, um, maybe even the sense that, he still loves. He still loves uh, Carla because that's sort of in the space as well. I mean, it comes chronologically a little bit afterwards in in the story, but it's in the you know like the the, the sort of constant the, the moment, right? It's in that sort of cr in that nexus of events. Uh, and um, yeah, I mean that 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 softens him and that's what that's what leads to that last piece of it uh which is really maybe just transitional to the rest um yeah i, I the the other hold I on the, before yeah. you go though 
The phrase was, we all did. Was that referring to that we all are grieving Cotter by? Is that what that no, was? No, no, no. It was that, that we all, we should look at it exactly, but we all regret not being there when he died. We all right. blamed ourselves. Right, yes. And there was a bit of guilt maybe for Lynn because... Right. He had this fantasy that he was the American, that if he'd been there, that was his Cotter by his protection because he had the, the white American guy. Now, he realized that that probably was entirely too, but he's carrying his own particular version of that guilt was explicated. I guess for me, somehow, it totally made sense hmm. that that would be what, because it 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 was almost like because when he, when that guy said that he was saying we all are feeling that way and it just sort of validated to me it made it more conscious and you know that this was a shared experience and to me that's what bumped him into you know finally being in touch with how it hmm. anyway when i read it i yeah. was like of course yeah I didn't. Yeah, that's that's. I I, haven't, I didn't look at it that way, but that makes more sense to me now because I wasn't sure. Like, was the, I wasn't sure that, about the the connection between him not being there. Maybe it's because he chose something. He chose something else. Like he, he right? He, there was a moment where he had to create the break with Cotterby. So he wasn't. He didn't go into death with him. He didn't. He wasn't there. From just like all those others were, but what? I don't know. I, get, I, I I may have to just keep thinking about it for a little while and just kind of keep feeling into it. But um, does it, like the blaming himself? I don't get that. I don't get why he bl- blames himself for. I mean, it was Cotter's mission. It was Cotter's, you know, not his hero curse. It was his curse that almost got them all killed. Uh, it was the horses, the pride. That was the part. Family. That- He's supposed to be there. It's not logical. <laughs> That's just relationship, you know? And I think all the men around it felt that way. They should be there. That's loyalty, commitment. They, you know, it's it's a thing. Is it a man thing? Or do you think it's a, uh, just a... I feel it. I don't think it's a man thing. <laughs> okay. All right. And, and I, I also think this nod to, like, the, the architecture of crag. Uh, tragic Greek, you know, kind of, you know, this, 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 um, the great man, this failed hero, you know, Um, there's something about Lynn's trajectory as a character in this story, um, surviving that. I mean, I, I was, I, I was feeling my way through this territory as well. And I was, I was drawn to um, looking at, this push and pull relationship Lynn has with moments of, you know, um, asserting his own autonomy and manhood and being a man on the run and super self-reliant and, you know, maintaining his killer edge or whatever. And then the camaraderie, the, the slight melting or the softening at the edges for his brother, brotherhood of thieves, you know, and, 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 and then, but then the deep one, the heart longs for, devotion and surrender and trust and in his deepest self-judgment he's a failed character who through weakness um in facing life's challenges turned to easy um drug-induced kind of avoidance of his own life responsibilities in australia did stupid crimes um that he was ashamed of and lost access to the things that mattered most, his family, his his child or children, I forget whether it was one or two, but so I think there's something, um, you know, con- the, the, the devotion that got triggered, you know, the, the love in, in around whatever sort of, you know, ersatz or substitute father, you know, was a doorway for him to actually just have, you know, have all of the reckoning with the repressed, you know, chaos, self-made chaos. And so, you know, it was that pushy pull thing where he would follow him now into anything, almost happy for the possibility that a noble death would clear, you know, the slate anyway. You see, in a certain way, he marches off to war with all of those misgivings, you know. But then, you know, the flip side of trusting a man, you know, we put, we put someone like Jesus on a cross and in the story of that mythology. And then we also love to chop people down from there. They can't have power over us. And, and so we're so ripe for betrayal. So I, I kind of see the convergence of a whole bunch of classical story 
archetypes or architectures coming together in, you know, having lifted him up and be willing to go die for him and then discovering the, the betrayal and then setting that massive adolescent boundary and, you know, and then he goes off and dies as every father eventually does. And then did we love him enough and forgive him enough? So anyway, this is me just sort of, you know, I'm just riffing on it. Um, not, you know, not uh, intending to extend or, or to, you know, make a counterpoint to the observation you guys are making, but that's what it, it all was touching for me. Mm. Well, I certainly went down the route um, that you all were discussing it when we were checking in the sense of uh, a story paralleling our lives, or you know, maybe even, you know, a series on TV or a movie. And I really uh, indulged myself, I guess, in that way with this and found it to be quite unusually effective. Um, more than any other, you know, novel I've I've read, and part of what grabbed me in this was the sense that if you shut down the grief, then you shut down everything. Or we're not sophisticated enough to to it seems to just shut down one particular little channel or 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 kind of emotion, if you will. It seems like it's a it's a whole hog sort of deadening, and I think you know it's kind of. Uh, noticing that based on life choices. Um, and then if I can just add a little bit or, or riff a bit, what you were saying, David, is caught or by on some level when they said we all did, it, it reminded me that, oh yeah, there was this immense devotion, you know, to this criminal Don, right? And, uh, you know, we learn about his, <clears throat> um, even as a criminal, kind of like the one in The Godfather, you know, there won't be prostitution there won't be heroin but it, as i think back on the story um even with the betrayal he let lynn suffer in prison yeah. and one of the things that that lynn noticed when he got out was amir's capacity to let the prison sentence redeem him somehow like it, to accept his own punishment and it's almost like Cotterby has this you know i don't know if it's exactly omniscience but he could see where that as bad as that was, almost like the betrayal was serving a higher good, we might think, by, you know, projecting that on Cotterby. You know, he, the, the book kind of opens up, like, how vast was his, you know, capacity both to manipulate, but also to hold his vision and, and um, you know, work his ends specifically for, for Lynn. So that, that also struck me with the we all did, that it it re-impressed Cotterby's, um, you know, largeness or greatness. More than one character says of Cotterby that they've never met a man, a truly, they've, met, they've never met a true, how exactly they put it, they, that of all the men they've met, he's one of the truly great ones. Like he, there's something almost of another order right. about him yeah. that, as good as some of these new mafia dons seem to be, they don't really match his depth. And the meaning, I think, that he maybe gave to their lives. Because there's something pretty... I mean, there's something kind of empty yeah. about the lifestyle and the activities of this group, right? They... And this is, I think, a subtext, right? They um, they have the you know the various businesses, the passports, the money laundering, et cetera, et cetera, and they can kind of walk around town and have people look at them and whisper, uh, and they could you know s strut a bit and you know show show off their their power. But there's something empty about it, and I think Lynn summarized it well on that notion of having a purpose but not having a meaning i like that he applied that to um he applied that to N nazir but i think it really applies to himself in this phase too like he has a purpose to make to make money to accumulate power to uh, be protected by uh, this network but it doesn't mean anything to him ultimately and i think that's why at the end of this we get that moment of temptation, which to me was a very, I got afraid in that moment when that boy and the way that it was described, 
how like their facial expression just kind of subtly changed. He smiled at him at first, and then there was a moment of confusion. And then the boy just instinctively like you know knew what Lin wanted, and so then changed his smile into more of a seductive smile. Like ah, oh, right. Uh, it was really but, well. Really- it was, and and I really didn't want him to um, to to buy that. <laughs> you know, that heroin from the, from the boy. I really didn't want him to do that, but that's the point that he had come to, right? Because, you know, he's got all the money he wants. He's got work. He's got friends. He's got sort of a brotherhood, but uh, there's something fundamental that he's still, that he's lacking. Can I, can I add a little comment to that? Um, Cause I believe that followed his essentially um, refusal to, uh, leave or go away with Lisa. Yeah. yeah she yeah. was described almost in an angelic level. It was almost like from choice with Lisa down to the heroin. It was like such an extreme set of temptations, I guess. That just occurred to me when you were talking that that had followed on right after his encounter with Lisa. That's right. Yeah, she invites him to even go back to to leave the country. And she right. she wants to be there. She's got this nice job doing the casting for the movie studio. She's working with Vikram and Letty now. They have their, you know, a company, I guess, an operation going. Uh, so twice yeah. women have tried to help him get out of, get out of his pole. And uh, he's, you get this sense he's in a, he's in a trance, right? Like when he asked those, the friends in the slum, you know, come, you know, why don't you come work for me? And they're like, are you kidding? You know, he, yeah, he's like, he doesn't even really get it. He's just in the trance, you know. Yeah, I think it's a good way of putting it. It is. Yeah. Possessed of some inner story that just completely colors, right. you know. Yeah, which, hey. Yeah, I was gonna go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I promised in our second meeting not to talk about my marriage, and then there I go again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah well we, we won't hold you to that <laughs> well, we, well, um, I wanted to say one other thing I wanted to go back because mm. remember when we were talking earlier about how the one thing he didn't do is he didn't kill anybody else he didn't cross that line and and despite Paul your, despite his numbness in many ways now I'm going to get emotional but there's still this just deep love and capacity to love that Lynn has that I think is part of why he can't cross. And there's a, there really is an ability about him despite his being in a trance and despite all this stuff that, um, I don't know. It's really moving to me. Uh, mm. Well said. And you know, and, and part of me, the therapist, part of me is like, you know, it sounds like his, he actually had pretty good parenting. He was loved. You know, and I, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, that, that touched. Um, it's, well, that, it reminds me of the conversation he had with uh, Khaled before Khaled uh, went off. Because uh, he, and maybe, with, I might be thinking, of, I may be confusing it with another one, but somebody tells him that uh, so-and-so didn't have any, you know, purpose or sense of, yeah, purpose, something like that. I have to remember it, but you do, and that, that it's that you love, you actually love people, you care for people. That whole slum thing, everybody was really impressed by that, That's right? right? Uh, and then he talks about how he was impressed, how Kaderbai was impressed, Carla was impressed, and like it seemed to be coming from a real, more pure place in his heart. Uh, and and that's what he like can't quite really like. It's there, You're, it's there, but it's it's like maybe like Paul was saying, it's. Uh, it's it it can't he can't access it he can't actually like manifest it or experience it because he hasn't dealt with this grief part and this guilt part and that whole hog you know of of what you have to I guess face or uh, go yeah. undergo uh, to liberate the you know the love uh, so thank you Marco that was really well said yeah. And you too, Pam. I could feel the feelings all the way over here in Walnut Creek. (laughs) (laughs) 
Yeah, one other just comment, I guess, is about the love between the men. Um, I, I don't think I've read many novels in which there's so much expression of love between men. Mm. Mm. Right. And I'm just sort of curious, you guys, you men, you know, what's that like mm. for you to, mm. what's that like? Does it? Did you happen to uh, endure <laughs> the, our, our collective meltdown, the three of us, uh, re- <laughs> making our way through Prabhaka's passing? No, I didn't. I didn't. Uh-huh. So there's some, there's some great. <laughs> some great passages and, and we probably, none of us would claim to be representative of the, of the average, but then, you know, you're, you're just asking, asking us, but that's really great. Uh, just to hear you identify that out loud because I hadn't, I hadn't said that to myself about this book in terms of, in terms of what I love, but this wonderful, you know, this, this author's, this author's style, which, uh, which I've come to love and trust as a storyteller when he starts taking me into these moments where he's exploring, you know, either very directly as sort of as a philosophy narrative, you know, or just by, you know, the, the, the storytelling and the unfolding of a character's path, like his love of Prabhaka or, or of course, you know, with Qadir Khan, um, now I can own, you know, um, that that's a huge part of why this book, you know, won, won my heart so much. So, hmm. yeah. I think I have a train going by behind I love me. that. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it depends on the time of day. Um, <laughs> uh, but I, I think that I'm so glad you pointed out that aspect of the book, uh, Pam, because... I hadn't really thematized it in my my reading, uh, and but you're right. There's all there are all these expressions of how the men love each other. There are moments when when Lin kind of knows that somebody's become his friend. When like at that moment when when this happened, I you know that's when we began to become friends. Cotter even asks Lin a few times, like, okay, well, who do you like? Who do you relate to? Who are your friends? in this group and there's some who he, you know gets along with uh, and others who, who, he, who he doesn't and i think that you know there's a whole field of course of men's studies and um men's groups and that kind of a thing and i actually don't know that much about that uh, other than sort of peripherally it's not been something i've directly studied or participated in but i think generally but what i understand those to be responding to is one of the at things I think they're responding to, and, one, and and that I certainly would corroborate in my own observations is that men actually don't have a lot of um, camaraderie amongst each other uh, in our society, and 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 that those that kind of closeness comes mainly through like shared trauma and sh- or shared experiences, like shared with of shared with shared purpose, military. For example, you hear about like you know the the band of brothers kind of idea. Maybe sports teams to some extent, depending on how professional they are and whether you know they're being traded and they're more business oriented or more like team oriented. Um, maybe work. Maybe some environments where there's you know groups of of men that are working on a project or a startup or something like that. And they're kind of like suffering something together and like they have to be there for each other. But even there, I don't know how strong it really is. And, um, and it's certainly like, yeah, I mean, without the opportunity to go to war together or to do something harrowing, like where that depends on your loyalty, like you, you will survive, you know, one for all and all for one kind of idea. Your survival is intimately tied up with that of the others in your troop. I don't know that men in our culture have as much just now. I think we're more actually separate and more kind of competitive with each other. And that's part of like the legacy of not just of Western civilization and, but even of sort of the individualism of, of this country in particular, the, the kind of idea of the rugged individual and the self-reliant man. I, I think that, like, I know that there are other cultures, for example, where it's very normal and natural for men to hold hands walking down the street 
or for boys to just be very affectionate with each other and it not be um, an indication of, uh, you know, homosexuality or, you know, what, what would in our culture and some cultures qualify you as more like less of a man, right? That that's other cultures just don't have those inhibitions. And I think it's sad, actually. It's something that is uh, probably a source of great pain for a lot of, a lot of us. Mm. Something that comes to mind um, as we're talking is that um, Lynn has a very rich interior life. And I noticed that other men that I am drawn to and develop closer friendships with all have a interior life. They're, they're as much identified with that inner world or their self-discovery or ongoing process. And in Lynn's, dis- when Lynn mentions that, for instance, is as I loved Abdullah even more, or, you know, I, you know, uh, <clears throat> I get the sense that he knows he feels it, but it's not ever something he says to them necessarily. It comes out more the, by the, by the actions or whatever. Um, but he shares that with us. Mm. We're let in on that on his, on an, on an inside level, I guess. Mm. Yeah, I also found myself reflecting on the, again, where the story lives for me as something against which um, there can be value to compare my life or contrast certain aspects of my own, my own process. Um, it once again is a reminder that for those of us who are willing, um, we don't need sort, sort of the, we don't need these melodramatic stages or relation, you know, kind of event constructs like war or, or sports or what have you, to actually just go for the primary value that those engender between men, those of us who have welcomed, you know, really deep loving friendships, you know, um, with with good good male friends, um, and and have come to discover the the safety and value and and balm to the degree that there's a collective healing that men owe all of humanity, but certainly each other. We certainly, uh, you know, have been, it's not been an easy go for women. That's the more obvious caricature of the, the polarity challenge. But I mean, it's us who have conscripted ourselves into fighting, you know, you know, tragic and terrible and needless wars. And it's us that, gets in sla- you know it's men enslaving men in in a, a myriad ways etc so the um you know here's this grand story which is you know obviously you know wonderful and entertaining um in its in its own right and so much more than that but lynn clearly given the aggregate kind of karmic signature of this incarnation i mean you know heroin addiction and 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 crime and you know um you know, he's assembling different ways to, to engage with men and, and, you know, and, and test uh, whether or not other male relations can satisfy the wounds around father or the absence of having been raised with more tenderness, et cetera, et cetera. And so I've just, you know, been reflecting, you know, what, regardless of, you know, and we each as men have a story about, you know, what were the first more challenging impressions of men and manhood and, you know, what have we had to work to overcome, you know, um, still, you know, what a, what an incredibly um, kind karma. If I, if I don't go too far to project similar stories onto my brothers here without knowing more of their own journey, despite, you know, the chaos of, you know, in my own case of, you know, having there be divorced and complications about male abandonment and then having a remarriage and complications about male hostile takeover and, you know, being outpowered and, you know, but I mean, the uh, relatively benign karma giving us room to, to work through those things and approach, you know, at least those men that we really feel called to approach, let alone circles of brothers, like in men's groups and all that, um, you know, just how lucky we really are that we don't find ourselves, if I can use yours, Pam, at that level of trance or egoic momentum that we have to trump up drama to actually just 
experience unity and bonding and more of the sort of these essential qualities that that re- actually require no drama when you're willing to just own them as as human value and need and and um you know healthy expression so hmm. that's nice hmm. thank you if it's um in 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 sync with timing and not to cut anyone off um the the um it's just so good. You don't know where to stop with the last few paragraphs, but I've got um, just under um, a three minute clip of um, the, the audiobook version. And when we feel ready and if that moment is, is, is close to, to now ish, um, we could, uh, we could play that. And... Yeah, I think we should. I, li- I, I, I'm, I, I, I like, I, I want to reflect uh, as well, just before you do that, I, yeah. I like that we extended this conversation in a way. We sort of, at a certain, I noticed it around seven o'clock, maybe half an hour ago, that there was a kind of lull and then something opened up and then we sort of explored some things. So I like that we did that. And, mm. I'm, uh, uh, and, I, and, and, I, and I'm glad that we're going to now get to hear that beautiful performance. Uh, I shared the book, by the way, with a friend of mine, a male friend of mine, uh, who uh, has read a bu- other books w- with me in other book club situations, uh, War and Peace, Infinite Jest, and he started listening to it. Uh, and so uh, he's really taken in, actually, by, by the novel. And I'm going to hang out with him maybe, I guess, next weekend, and he's going to try to finish the book by then. Mm. Um, so That's wonderful. That, that certainly is one way that men can, um, you know, bond through trials and tribulations is, through the virtual uh, realities of the text uh, <laughs> and they're intermingling with our own. Mm. So true. Yeah. Pam, thanks for uh, drawing us through that last personal piece. That was very kind and it was very touching to be invited yeah. to go there. And I really do. I mean, these are such beautiful, beautiful brothers. It's been a huge, rich part of this journey. And, and sometimes just to find the three of us on a call or something like that has been a, a special moment. Um, so it was very nice of you to, Give us a chance to own that out loud. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, beloveds, here we go. Evening dimmed the afternoon's bright halo. A haze of dusty smoke and vapor misted the horizon, sizzling soundlessly, as if the sky at the distant wall of the world was dissolving into the waters of the bay. Most of the boats and ferries were safely tied to their mooring posts at the dock beneath me. David, it stopped. David, it stopped. Oh, somehow you're muted. I'm oh, so, so sorry. It was uh, uh, the the boats in the bay, and that's the thank again. you so much. Thank you for so much. At him, smiling to match his happy grin. I'll be with you soon. No, come, Lynn, he urged. Come now. Sorry. Most of the boats and ferries were safely tied to their mooring thank posts you. at the dock beneath me. <laughs> Sorry. Others rose and fell and rose again, swaying on the secure tethers of their sea anchors. High tide pushed the swollen waves against the long stone wall where I stood. Here and there along the boulevard, frothy plumes, like gasps of effort, slapped up over and onto the white footpaths. Strollers walked around the intermittent fountains, or ran laughing through the sudden boom and spray. In the little seas of my eyes, those tiny blue-grey oceans, waves of tears pushed hard against the wall of my will. Did you send him? I whispered to the dead Khan, my father. Assassin grief had pushed me to that wall where the street boys sold heroin. And then, when it was almost too late, Abdullah had appeared. Did you send him to save me? The setting sun, that funeral fire in the sky, seared my eyes. And I looked away to follow the last flares of cerise and magenta streaming out and fading in the ocean-mirrored sapphire of the evening. And staring out across the rile and ruffle of the bay, 
I try to fit my feelings within a frame of thought and fact. Strangely, weirdly, I'd re-found Abdullah and re-lost Kadarbai on the same day, in the same hour. And the experience of it, the fact of it, the inescapably fated imperative of it, helped me to understand. The sorrowing I'd shunned had taken so long to find me, because I couldn't let him go. In my heart, I still held him as tightly as I'd hugged Abdullah only minutes before. In my heart, I was still there on the mountain, kneeling in the snow and cradling the handsome head in my arms. As the stars slowly reappeared in the silent endlessness of sky, I cut the last mooring rope of grief and surrendered to the all-sustaining tide of destiny. I let him go. I said the words, the sacred words. I forgive you. And it was good. And it was right. I let the tears fall. I let my heart break on my father's love. Like the tall waves beside me that hurled their chests against the wall and bled onto the wide white path.